We started the series the weekend immediately after Thanksgiving in anticipa anticipation for Christmas, and it's just amazing how fast Christmas has really come upon us, right? I mean, Christmas is like right around the corner next week. And, but we have also come pretty quick to our final hymn, our final hymn of praise found in the Gospel of Luke. And if we can think of terms of music for a moment, I want to share something with you. Some of you may not know this, but I used to just love, absolutely love music. I used to write my own songs. I had uh, guys, beat makers, uh, uh, producers that would make my music. And, and my dad and, and I built a studio in my home for uh, audio recording. I, I even went to school for a, a, a short time for audio recording. I went on to perform at different venues but one of the greatest things about music that I, that I really enjoyed, and I share this with my son often because my son likes to do audio recording. One of the things that I, that I really loved about uh, recording or that I loved about recording was the construction of the song. I don't know if you guys realize how much work, how much time, and how much effort goes into record, recording a song. A song, songs are really time consuming. It takes a lot of uh, art, artistry. Well, one thing that, uh, that is the goal of every artist, every recording artist in constructing the song is to br bring the creation of that song that one had in his mind or her mind to reality. And so, Upon bringing that song uh, to reality and getting it to a point of perfection, then once you gave the okay to say, look, the song is done, then what we would do from there was we would send it out for mastering, okay? Now, the, I, got a, I got a purpose in what I'm telling you guys here, but once you send the song out to mastering, now at that point, the song is locked into history, okay? It's locked into the genre and the style that it will forever stay. And many people will go back to that song and listen to it year, year, up to years after, right? And so I just wanted to bring that to your attention because when I think of these ancient hymns that we're going over in the Gospel of Luke, these ancient Advent songs, these ancient Christmas carols. Remember, these, these songs that we've been going over in this, this series, the first one was Mary's Magnificat, the second one was Zacharias Benedictus, then the third one was the Song of the Angels, the Gloria. Today we're going to be talking about the Nunc Dimittis. When we think about these ancient songs, these ancient Christmas carols, the moment that they re were reported onto the pages of Holy Scripture, they were locked into history. Luke has really given us four great records, or if I may, four great recordings, four great recordings of praise to God from his gospel. Remember, these, these uh, recordings, these songs of praise were in response to the coming of the Christ, the coming of the Messiah. That's the same word right there. Greek is Christ, Messiah is Hebrew. Mary's song, the one that I just mentioned, the Magnificat, was a recording of praise to God from her innermost being. And it was for this, the fact that she carried a child inside of her womb. This child she carried for nine months. This child who would be the Savior. She had a lot to praise God for. 
and the Benedictus, the Song of Zacharias, Luke gives us a recording of his praise to the Lord for the anticipation of his son who would be the forerunner to the Christ. One who would prepare the way for the Lord himself, the Lord who would himself enter into human history. And if you don't think that this is a true story, time has been affected by the birth of Christ, right? You have A.D. and then you have B.C. B.C. and A.D. B.C. before Christ, A.D. in the year of the Lord. I was listening to a, a radio broadcast the other day on RefNet, and, um, or maybe it was from Albert Muller, but secularists uh, try to change that. Those who do not believe in the birth of Christ, those who do not believe in God, have changed it to some other letters like C-E and B-E, because they will not acknowledge Christ. But regardless of what they don't acknowledge, they do acknowledge that in time, Christ has affected time. So even for the one that doesn't believe, they still have to go based on Christ's calendar. So, Luke gave us a third recording of the song of angels, the Gloria. And this is when the heavenly host, and I explained to you that the heavenly hosts were angel armies who burst forth in praise over the fields in Bethlehem to lowly shepherds, outcast shepherds, for the coming of Christ the Lord. And this is what they sang. They sang in Luke 2, 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men, in whom he is, in whom he is pleased. And now today, Luke gives us a fourth and final recording in his gospel, the song of Simeon, which is called the Nunc Dimittis. That's the Latin uh, for the first words in the Latin Vulgate of this uh, particular verse, this particular passage. And in my translation, and you guys can look in yours, it reads, and I think it's in verse 25, if I'm not mistaken. Let me get there real quick. It may be in verse 25. Well, anyways, I'll go ahead and read it out for you, but this is how it reads in the New American Standard. Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. The nunc dimittis. Now dismiss me, Lord, is what that means. So before we get to that, why don't, you, why don't we all get acquainted with the passage, and um, you guys can turn with me in your Bibles, and we'll read from verse 21 to 35 for a moment. And I want you to really pay attention as I read Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 35. Luke chapter 2, verses 21 and 35, or through 35. This is what it says. And when eight days had passed before a circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses was completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of, two, a turtle, of turtle dove or two pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem who was, whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the Spirit, in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for, for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, at verse 29, the new images, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, 
a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, the child is appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel, and for a sign, a sign to be opposed. And the, the sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, I don't know what you guys think about this text. But this text is a, a very convicting text. We got to go through the ins and outs. There are some things that I think you should know before we begin. If we look at the Gospels, we can understand that there was great unbelief in the time of Jesus. Now, a lot of us understand that the Jews were considered God's people. And so you might think just because you have a name over you, a title over you, over you that you're God's people. But the problem was that Jesus was found himself in constant conflict with those who called themselves the people of God. Jesus was in constant conflict with them due to their hypocrisy and unbelief that led them to the rejection of Christ, that led them to put Jesus Christ on the cross. But I also want to point out to you that there, are, that there was a remnant there was a small remnant of true believers in the time of Christ. And I'm going to show you who they are, or who they were. I want to show you how the people used in God's redemptive plan in the coming of Christ were described. Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, in Matthew 1.19, was described as a righteous man. Luke described Zacharias and Elizabeth as both being righteous in the sight of the Lord, in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. Mary can be seen uh, as, uh, as a part of the remnant of true believers, not only how she exalted the Lord when she said, my soul exalts the Lord, the Magnifica, my soul magnifies the Lord, in that song, but also in the passages before us, and I'm going to explain that to you when we get there. But Simeon, one of the characters in our story today, Luke says that this man was righteous and devout. Righteous and devout. We also learn of a prophet prophetess that we haven't read just yet. We learn of a prophetess in verses 36 to 39. This prophetess was named Anna, who, who in her service to the Lord, the Lord manifests the righteousness that looks like the rest of that small remnant. In the text before us, I want you to take notice of Luke's emphasis on the law in this passage. In verse 22, you guys can look in your Bible and follow along, follow along verse 22, according to the law of Moses. He says it again in verse 23, as it is written in the law of the Lord. In verse 24, in the law of the Lord. And in verse 27, the custom of the law, which all voice Luke's concern to show us the ceremonial and ritual requirements of the law of Moses and how they were being carefully observed. Another constant repeat in this passage by Luke is the mention of the Holy Spirit. In verse 25, it says the Holy Spirit was upon him. In verse 26, revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. Verse 27, he came in the Spirit. Now the emphasis on ceremonial and uh, ceremonial obligation and the prophetic work of the Spirit of God played a major role in the text before us today. And I'm going to show you why as we move forward. Now, these people, when we say that they were righteous, many people think that they're righteous when they do something good. And so you might get that, that, uh, that notion that just because you, you honor a few things and you think that you're good in a few different sections of your life, that you're good. 
Remember what the Lord says. He says that your good deeds are as filthy rags to the Lord. There's nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. There's nothing that you can do to earn heaven. And so when we look at the righteousness of these people, it was a righteousness that was outside of themselves. It wasn't something that they were doing in order to, to uh, be obedient to these observances or ritual. As a matter of fact, I'll even go a little bit further. It's something that God did inside them to even be able to do those things. Remember, all the way back in the book of Genesis, what does Genesis say? In the beginning, God. You go, we just learned about this in Wednesday night Bible study. You go all the way to John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was Jesus Christ. Even in salvation, as we learned in Wednesday night Bible study, it all begins with God. You do nothing to earn your own salvation. So, the emphasis on ceremonial obligation and the prophetic work of the Spirit of God play a major role in this text. And we have to understand why these people were called righteous. We haven't heard, or we haven't heard the mention of the Spirit's work in. I'm sorry, let me read that. I got my notes all twisted up. Haven't we heard mention of the Holy Spirit's work in each one of the songs that we have been going through? We understand that. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit. We come to the text today and we see that this man, it says that the Holy Spirit was upon him. So before we get started in this, uh, this uh, study today, we're going to look at, at this song in three separate parts. The first part is the prophetic scene. Okay, this is where it all takes place. The second part is Simeon's prophetic proclamation. And the third part is the praise of the prophet. This began in Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. Luke chapter 2 and verse 21. Now this isn't a part of our, our text today, but we need it as a foundation to get started. Luke 2 and 21 says this, And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angels before he was conceived in the womb. Now, first and foremost, I want you to, I want you to keep your focus on, on Jesus' parents. Jesus' parents in obedience to the law of requirement circumcised Jesus on the eighth day. Hold that number in your mind, the eighth day. What was circumcision? How many of you know what circumcision is? I, I, I know that we know that it is a kind of a, a grotesque rite, right? Or, or a, a thing that, that, that we do to our little boys, that some of us do to our little boys. But you have to understand what it stood for. It was a sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And it was also a mark of Israel's national identity. So with me saying this, you have to understand that Jews were known to be the covenant people because of circumcision. Because of circumcision. Jewish men were all circumcised where the, the Gentiles, the, the nations around Israel were not. But there's something deeper. Circumcision taught the need for cleansing from the depravity of sin. And this spoke to the problem of sin passing down to each generation. So we understand that because there was a need of circumcision, that there was constant sin. We were born into depravity. From the time of birth, we grow up, we have our children, they're born into sin. And the, gener the generations of sin keep on going down, right? We understand that. So we see that this uh, circumcision taught the necessity of cleansing from sin. It was also a symbol of the spiritual cleansing. 
as it says in the New Testament, that it was a symbol of spiritual cleansing of the heart that takes place at salvation. So what, are, what does that mean? That means that when you come to Christ in salvation, the old man is cut off. The old man is cut off and you are new. So this verse runs parallel with the birth, circumcision, and naming of John the Baptist. Immediately we understand that circumcision was established in the Old Testament under the Abrahamic covenant. And it had to be done eight days after the child's birth. This is pretty important to the rest of our text. So you know that this was a very important ceremony or rite in order to observe God. This brings us to the next part of our story, and this brings us to the prophetic scene. Now we, we get a, a greater understanding of what's going on here. Look with me at, at Luke chapter 2 and verse 22, and it says, And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is referring not to Jesus' purification or Joseph's purification, but to the purification of the mother, which was Mary. Now this goes all the way against the Catholic thought that Mary was without sin. Okay? This absolutely combats those doctrines of the Catholic Church. And I'm going to tell you why. This is referring to Mary's purification and we know that because in Leviticus 12, 1 through 5, we've got to do a little bit of reading to get where I need to be. So I need you guys to hear this and understand. Leviticus 12, verses 1 through 5, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, When a woman gives birth and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days. As in the days of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. But on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin, the baby, shall be circumcised. Then she shall remain in the blood of her uh, purification for 33 days. Okay? Now, it wasn't the same when the baby girl was born. As a matter of fact, the time was doubled for a baby girl. So she had to wait not 33 days, but 66 days in order for her to be purified. Now listen to this. That happened in order that her uncleanness, her purification process needed to happen in order for her to get back into the temple to worship God. So as with circumcision, a mother's purification after childbirth also illustrated the need for the cleansing of sin. Sin is being passed on and shown to be passed on from generation to generation. And so in this rite or ritual, you, you see that even the mother has to be purified before she can come into the holy presence of God. And so is, is this making sense of what salvation is? You have to be cleansed before you can come into the, the holy presence of God. This is what salvation is. But let me go ahead and go further. So the seven days plus the eighth day, right? But the seven day plus 33 days totals out to 40 days after giving birth to the boy. And the mother could then enter into the temple again. This shows you how serious God is about holiness. This shows you how serious God is about his holiness. And people see this, right, all these rules and regulations, and what's the first thing that comes to my eye? I do not want to come to Christ. Absolutely not. Why? Because there's too many rules and there's too many regulations. And so they say, well, I'd rather not. But one thing that I want to show you about this young couple, remember, Mary was nothing but 13 years old. And Joseph could have been around 15 years old. And one thing that I want to show you is this, that these young kids had a heart for God that was more than just ritual. And so, we see something 
going on here with Mary and Joseph, you see how serious they are in obedience to God. This is much more than rules and regulations for this young couple. This is a lifestyle. This is them loving the God of their lives. This is them who are absolutely in love with him and adore him and want to glorify him in their lives, right? So, one more thing before we move on. The word there, again, you might think that that refers to Joseph and, and, uh, and Jesus taking part in this, in this uh, purification process, with, but, I, but it's refuted because according to the Old Testament, again, it was only for the mother, but the word there could have been put there because they were going to do something else while they were there in Jerusalem. And we see that in the next part of the verse where it says they brought him, pointing to the child, up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And so I think that that's the evidence of what I was just telling you. But there was also a ritual that involved the presentation or the dedication of the firstborn son in the temple. So go with me to Luke chapter 2 and verse 23. And I want you guys to look at this for a moment. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And this comes from Exodus chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. And this is what it says there. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn, the first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast. It belongs to me, says the Lord. The firstborn child. Well, firstborn son. And in the presentation or dedication, the child is said to truly belong to the Lord. That's what that really means. The child, the firstborn son, is said to truly belong to the Lord. But just how much Jesus belongs to the Lord is something that these young parents are going to they, they don't understand right now, but they're slowly going to come to an understanding, as you guys will see right now in a few moments. But, <clears throat> even though Luke doesn't mention it here in this text, the parents would have paid five shekels to redeem the firstborn as prescribed in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 15. Don't get, don't get, uh, don't get annoyed with me, because we're going through a little bit of Old Testament text. We need it, though. It's good. So this, this uh, uh, five shekels that needed to be paid was a redemption process right here. This would have been accompanied also by sacrifices that Mary would have offered for herself. And we're going to see that in the next verse. And it quite possibly might be that, that she had to offer some for Jesus for the dedication dedication process. But look with me at Luke chapter 2 and verse 24 and this is what it says. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And this comes from Leviticus 12.6. Now I need you to really concentrate right here. And this is what it says. When the days of her purification are completed for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering. Then she shall offer before the Lord and make atonement for her. This is for her sins. As she shall be cleansed from the flow of her blood, this is the law for her who bears a child, whether a male or female, but if she cannot afford a lamb, now here's where I want you to pay attention, but if she cannot afford a lamb, then she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons, the one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her so that she will be clean. Verse 24 gives us a little clue about the financial status of Joseph and Mary. We understand that when the angel came to Mary, she was of a lowly state, a humble state. We understand that she was poor. There was nothing significant about little Mary. As a matter of fact, the town that she came from, Nazareth, was an insignificant town. 
The, nor the northern part of Israel from where she came from was a hated part of Israel. And so we, we see right here with the offering of turtle doves and uh, pigeons that she was of a lowly stature. Joseph was of a lowly stature. They were poor. Okay? So uh, that, I just wanted to make that point. But, when, again, don't lose focus. Mary and Joseph's obedience shines brightly in the text, giving to us the ability to look at the righteousness of their observances to God's law. Okay? Now, to... Uh, the reason why I say this is because how do we see righteousness in them? Well, first of all, you see them on their own without their parents. Guess what they're doing? They're going to the temple and they're fulfilling God's obediences, his observances, right? You try to get somebody in church who doesn't want to be here, and what's going to happen? It doesn't mean anything to them, right? It absolutely does not mean anything to them. They come with their reverence. They'd rather be somewhere else. But when you look at Mary and Joseph, I want to, and again, it shows you in their actions that they want to honor and glorify God. They want to be where God is. Isn't that amazing? So what's the life of a Christian? What's the heart of a Christian? What should a Christian's heart be like? We want to be there where our Lord is, right? So now the presentation was a sign of the redeeming of the people. This was one of the greatest ironies that we find right here in this, in this text. Symbolically, before Jesus redeemed his people, from their sins, baby Jesus experienced the sign of redemption himself going into the temple. This is ironic. They're going in with baby Jesus into the temple for a symbol, right? A symbol of redemption. And they're holding in their hands the one who is to redeem the world. You guys see that? This is who they're holding. So now, you may be wondering why Jesus had to be circumcised. You may be wondering why Jesus had to be presented or dedicated in the temple if he was sinless. Why would he have to do that? Jesus was sinless. It sounds like a contradiction. And I know that there are people who would love to scream contradiction there. But let me show you why, because it's also said in the scriptures in Galatians 4.4, 4, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, and then what? Born under law. Born under law. Jesus Christ had to be born under law. You guys see that? And so, you know, when we see Jesus being baptized, the, the question arises, well, Jesus, that, that baptism of John was a baptism for sinners. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? And I explained to you last time that Jesus tells John, because John didn't want to baptize him. Jesus tells John, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. What does it mean to fulfill all righteousness? That was a command given by God to the prophet to go out and baptize his people. That was a commandment. That was a law that was given by God to the prophet. Jesus had to honor every part of the law of God. He had to fulfill every part of the law of God. So we see that he's the only one that could be born under the law and the one, the only one who can keep the law perfectly. From the time that he was a baby, to the time that he died on the cross, to the time that he ascended into heaven, Jesus kept the law perfectly. Now, there's also another reason for this. And because he's the only one that can keep the law perfectly, his righteousness 
could be credited to believers who can't keep the law perfectly. So just think about it. Christians are no different than any other sinner. Right? If you ever hear a Christian thinking that they're different from every other sinner, in the sense that they don't need salvation, well, the problem is that they may not be Christian. They don't understand their need for a Savior. Jesus came to save from what? Sin. We all need Christ. This brings us to the next section. Simeon's prophetic proclamation. Luke chapter 2 and verse 25. And it says this, There was a man in Jerusalem who named, whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Now, there is nothing else said about this man in Scripture, and in his own words that are recorded here in Luke, um, Luke seems to imply that this man was old, and we're going to see that right now when we, when we move forward. But, but we also know that from this text that, that Simeon was a man who lived in Jerusalem. The word righteous now. Let's go back to that word righteous for a second, because we were talking about these people that God considered righteous. What makes a person righteous? Well, the word righteous in describing this man, along with those others that we were talking about, is like their father Abraham. His righteousness was imputed or accounted to him because of his what? His faith. Not because of what he did, but because of his faith, right? And so you see that with these people, because of their faith, what they believed in, in God. And this made them righteous. And now we get to the word devout. The word devout is pretty important too because, and we shouldn't miss this because it carries the meaning of being cautious. It carries the meaning of being cautious. Now I want to ask you guys a question. Those of you who profess Christ, are you cautious in your Christianity? Are you cautious? What's your Christianity look like? Because in Luke's writings, this word cautious, right? Devout. It, it describes reverence for God. Or it describes God fearing. And it conveys to us the idea of being careful to obey and honor God. Are you careful in the way that you live your life? What's your life like? God in Simeon shows us an example. Simeon's uh, life was an example of a godly life before others. And so you can see that he lived the command of Christ for a life that shines the brightness of Christ before Christianity ever was. Can you believe that? These, beloved, are called old Testament saints. These are those who look forward to the coming of the Messiah, look forward to the promises of the Messiah. People ask all the time, how were Old Testament saints saved? Were they saved in the same way as New Testament saints are saved? Yes, except they look forward to the coming promise. In the New Testament, Jesus already came, and we look to Christ. You guys see that? Salvation has always been the same. And so, again, we see that example in the remnant of true believers. Okay? True believers. And we also see it in the text that he was looking for the consolation of Israel. What does this mean? This is what all Jews look for. Now, when you guys look at, at in the, the time of Christ, in his ministry, people left him. Why did they leave him? They left him because they were looking for a political restoration, right? They were looking for Jesus to be the king who would set up his kingdom and kick Rome out of Israel and set up an earthly kingdom there and then, right? And this was the thought. So we understand that, that 
that that's what they were looking towards, but, but Jews looked for that deliverance. They were looking for that restoration of Israel. And that word is paraclesis, paraclesis. Now, this is a pretty interesting word. It actually means consolation. Now, in the New Testament, where Jesus is giving the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter, right? Well, it comes from that same word, paraclete. I didn't say parakeet. I said paraclete, right? The paraclete, the Comforter. And so that word is comfort. The, the people of Israel were looking for comfort from their many distresses from the outside nations. So you might be inclined to think that this was the, that, that his mind was on a political restoration like many others. But if you were to think that way, you would be wrong, and we'll see right now in a few minutes why. But look with me at the next part of that verse, and it says, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Some even now only believe that the Holy Spirit was given only at the day of Pentecost. Remember, that's when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles, and then that was the beginning of the church in Acts. You guys remember that, right? But some people think that that was the only time that the Holy Spirit was given. But you'd be wrong in thinking that. The Holy Spirit has made appearances throughout the Old, Old Testament. It wasn't in the same way as what happened on the day of Pentecost where he lived in the believer. But I do want to share something with you. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, 17? This is what he said to them. He said that the Holy Spirit would be with them. You guys remember that? This is before the falling of the Holy Spirit. He says that the Holy Spirit will be with them. And there, and there, well, let me read this again. He would be with them, and there would come a time when he, the Holy Spirit, would be in them. We were just talking again about this on Bible study the other night, why it's wrong for a Christian to look at bad things on TV, hear bad music, do things that they ought not be doing. Why? Because of the Holy Spirit that lives in you. You guys see that? So what happens when you do that, Christian? What are you doing? You're defiling the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Bible clearly says that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Why will, do we want to grieve the Holy Spirit if he lives in us? Why do we want to go back to the lifestyles that we came from if the Holy Spirit lives in us? you got to understand, beloved, that you cannot go back to that lifestyle. The Lord has done something in your life. He's renewed you. You're brand new. That's what it means to be born again. Right? You cannot go back to that lifestyle. Especially if the Lord lives in you. So I thought that was pretty important. We have to understand what, what it means about the Holy Spirit. And so we understand from this text that Luke is showing us the prophetic enablement of a person by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was upon this man. He was upon this man. This man was able to, to receive revelation that, like we'll see right now in a moment because the Holy Spirit was upon him. Look with me on verse 26 and it says this, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the, Christ, the, the Lord's Christ. Do you guys see that? Before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. This wasn't a gift that was given to everybody. God sent Simeon, set Simeon apart for, for a very unique privilege. The Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Now, I heard a, I heard a, a pastor uh, kind of joke around with this. He said, um, Simeon could have engaged in all kinds of daredevil acts, and his wife could have turned around and said to him, Simeon, be careful. And he would have turned around to his wife and said, I have nothing to worry about. I haven't seen the coming of the Lord yet, right? 
I know that that sounds like a joke. But what I want that to do for you is I want you to think about that for a moment. He had not seen the coming of the Lord until this very day. So with all joking aside, this may have weighed on him very heavy. It may have caused him to be at the temple often in hope of seeing this great thing that the Lord had revealed to him. You guys see that? This was on his mind. This was on his heart. This is what he lived for. As a matter of fact, go with me to Luke chapter 2 and verse 27, and it says there, And he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out from him the custom of the law, or carry out for him the custom of the law, before this day, you guys got to understand that Mary and Joseph had no idea who Simeon was. And before this day, he may not have even known who they were. But I want you to see God's sovereign hand in the, in the lives of people. How does God work in people? Look, she just had Jesus, right? She needed to be purified. She, he needed to be circumcised. And then the baby needed to be presented to the Lord in dedication, right? At the temple. So on their minds was to get to the temple, since they were in Bethlehem, only five miles away from, from Jerusalem anyway, so that they can go take care of their observances before the Lord, right? But we see something right here. With Simeon, the Spirit moved him to go into the temple. So you have God moving Mary and Joseph to the temple, and then you have the Spirit of God moving Simeon to the temple. And what do you see? They run into each other. Right? They run into each other. Now, before we move on, I just want you to understand what part of the temple it was. Huron is the, is the word that's used for temple here. And that part of the temple was considered the, the, either the court of the Gentiles or the court of the women. Because remember, women couldn't go past a certain point. Gentiles couldn't go past a certain point, right? And, man, and, and even if you weren't a priest, you couldn't even go to, into the most holy place. So we have to understand where they were in the temple courts. So this, the reason why I say that is because this is where Sim, Simeon was. Simeon, but if they were in the court of the Gentiles or the court of the women, this is where he appeared, and this is where they appeared. This is where they ran in together. And then in verse 20, 28, it says, Then when, when that happened, that clash happened, that intersection happened, then he took him, the child, in his arms and blessed God and said, You guys see that? <laughs> if you don't like the doctrine of predestination that God knows the future from the beginning, then you're not going to like this. Because God predestined that this day was going to happen the way it happened. You guys see that? And that what does that prove? It proves what the Bible said. God knows the, the future from the beginning and the beginning even on into the future, right? God knows all things. And so when he took this young child, this baby, into his arms and blessed God and said, it's here where we hear the name of this song. This is a song of praise. It's called the Nuc Dimittis in Latin. Simeon's song of praise. And when you understand what moved him to that praise, it was the fulfillment of another promise of God. You want to know what, what moved him to this to burst out in praise? It was because he saw the fulfillment of God's promises right before his eyes. And wasn't this the cause for praise for the other songs that we studied? What happened in the other songs? With Mary, what happened? She burst forth in praise because of the promise that she got to see come to pass in her own life. She saw the Abrahamic covenant coming to fulfillment. And Zacharias prays when he burst forth. What did he say? He named three covenants, as I've been telling you, right? He praised God for the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and in Jeremiah, the new covenant. 
There was much to praise God for. And what did the angels praise God for? They praised God for the fulfillment of the coming Messiah to man. You guys see that? So Luke, verse 29-32 says this, Now, Lord, this is a new Demetrius, you are pleasing, uh, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And we see exactly what moved him to that praise in the fulfillment of another promise of God. And wasn't this the case again for all those other songs that we studied? Absolutely. Simeon doesn't use the, the usual word for Lord in the sentence where it says, now Lord. As a matter of fact, he uses, he uses a stronger word, which is despotis. And in our English translation, what does that mean? Despot. And, and in the English trans translation of that word, um, it's somewhat tainted. And I'll tell you why, because you get the notion in English that that's a tyrannical authority, a tyrannical power, right? A power filled with tyranny. Hitler, for instance, right? And so that's what the, the English definition gives to us. In one of the definitions, the second, de the first definition of that word is absolute, a ruler with absolute power or authority. Now there's a reason why I'm saying this. He used the word despotes for Lord. Because no sooner, no, no sooner than he said that, what does he, what does he say a few uh, words after that? He says, your bond servant, your bond servant. That's a bad translation in all of our English translations. And the reason why is because that word is doulos, and it should be translated slave. That's exactly what it should be translated. Your slave, your slave is able to depart in peace. Okay? That's what the English should sound like, or the Greek. Now, I want to show you guys something here. The wording that Simeon uses here indicates his total allegiance and total submission to the authority of God. So now, people who do not like rules and regulations and especially coming to God, they do not like His commandments. They will not submit to His commandments. you got to understand what it's like for someone who loves God. Those are not commandments that move in terror in your lives. As a matter of fact, it moves, it moves you in humble obedience to Him. Right? As a matter of fact, it moves you to total allegiance to God. Total submission to God. You love to honor God's law. As a Christian, you should love to honor the Lord in your life. So, I want you guys to, to know this, that Simeon now says that he can die in peace according to the promises of God. Now he can die in peace. This doesn't mean that he was in terror. But again, he is now comforted that he has saw what the Lord had promised. Remember I told you that Simeon wasn't just looking for political consolation or restoration in Israel. He wasn't looking for political restoration. And you might, you might be asking, well, well, how do you know that, Pastor Sam? How do you know that? How can you even say that? Well, first of all, listen to his words here. Um, in verses 30 through 32, this is what he says. In verse 30, he says, For my eyes have seen your salvation. Okay? The next, uh, verse 31, it says, Which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples. And 32, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. What he sees is salvation in a person while he's holding up Jesus in the temple. He's looking at salvation in his hands. And not only that, 
What's Jesus' name? Jesus' name is Yahweh saves. Yahweh is salvation. God is salvation. This is what he's holding in his hands. Now, for many of us, we don't, we don't even think two, two bits about that, right? We don't, we don't think about Jesus that closely. It's not only that, that this Christ, this salvation is all, it's more. He understands that in his theology, in his, in his mind, in his way of thinking that this salvation that he's holding in his hands is a light of revelation to the Gentiles. A light of revelation to the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't have the oracles of God. They didn't have Holy Scripture to know God's salvation. The Jews did. So imagine this to, to the nations outside of Israel. This was a light of revelation to the Gentiles of salvation, right? The Gentiles didn't have the oracles of God to know God's salvation, and they were in the dark. But Jesus called himself, what? The light of the world. As a matter of fact, in John 1, he says that he is the light of men, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. And to the Jews, he is the glory of your people, Israel. Why does he call himself the glory of Israel? Because he is the fulfillment of God's promises to his people. Look with me at Luke chapter 2, verse 23. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. You guys see that? With the birth of this child, Joseph and Mary had heard some absolutely amazing things when it came to Jesus Christ. And the reason Jesus stayed with Mary rather than putting her away, knowing that she might have been pregnant, impregnated by some other man, remember, God revealed to, to him in a dream that it was of God, right? And it was because of him, because of God, that he stayed. And those who stumble, listen to this. Um, I might have been moving on a little bit too fast. Let me see, where am I? Okay, so again, you guys are seeing that, that all these things that are happening, and these people are being, uh, they're marveling at the things that are happening with God. You guys get to see God's sovereign hand. And this verse implies that these things continued to amaze them. They were learning new things that were amazing them. And then Simeon turns to Mary and he, well, he actually blesses a blessing upon both Joseph and Mary, but specifically to Mary. And we see that in verse 30, 34. And it says that Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, the child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. Now I want you guys, if you guys haven't heard the sermon yet, I want you guys to pay attention to this. What this is saying is that, yes, Jesus will raise people up, okay? But he will also be a rock of offense to people. He offends people, right? People will stumble because of him. And those who stumble because of him will fall greater and greater into wickedness. And every time they reject Christ, the sin they carry will be magnified. The sin that you carry and your rejection of Christ will be magnified. Listen to this, and I want you guys to hear this, and I want you guys to hear this loud and clearly. People literally declare them th themselves by their attitude to Christ. You show who you are and what you reject or accept about Christ. As a matter of fact, I say it another way. The way that people respond to Jesus indicates where your hearts really are before God. That's pretty intense. Again, let me read that. The way that people respond to Jesus indicates where your hearts really are before God. Do you love him truly in your heart? It shows where your heart is before God. Do you play around? 
and show us where your heart is before God. Luke 22 and verse 35 says, And the sword will pierce even the, your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. We're coming to an end. Now you think, do you think that Mary remembered throughout the time Jesus was growing up, the time that he became a man, do you think that it ever crossed her mind that, that um, she would reflect on what Simeon had told her in the past? Do you ever think that when the day came when Jesus was rejected by those whom he created, not only his own creation, but his own people, the Jewish people. Do you ever think that when that day came and that soldier took that spear and he went up to Jesus on that cross and pierced him in the side, do you think that Mary felt that? Let me put it to you another way. You mothers, how many of you feel the pain of your children? You fathers, how many of you feel the pain of your children, right? You guys feel that, right? Listen to how this is being described here. That word sword is used in the Greek of a double-edged sword. We're talking about a big sword, a sword that is able to thrust through, right? And so Luke is describing here that a sword will pierce even your own soul. As Mary was seeing her baby boy on the cross being pierced through. Think about it. She was being pierced through in her own soul. That's a pretty intense feeling, right? And Jesus' death on the cross, it doesn't even stop there. Jesus' death on the cross goes even further. What does it say? It says because that would pierce her soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Right there in verse 35. When Jesus died on that cross, you better believe that the hearts of the people were revealed in their rejection of Christ. Again, this goes back to what I was saying before. The way that you respond to Jesus indicates where your heart is before God. And you know who's the cause of that? Jesus Christ is the cause of that. Remember what it says in John 1. It says that he is the light. The light came into the world and the darkness did not. You guys remember that? Did not accept him. Did not it rejected him that night. You guys remember that? So his own people, Jesus' own people on the cross, what did they cry out? Rather than accept him as the glory of Israel, some did. What did the majority of the people cry out when, when before Jesus even went to the cross? He was being judged. What did they cry out? Crucify, crucify. Jesus revealed the hearts of those who rejected him. Even to this day, we see the same response from not only his people, the Jewish people, but for those from those who hate God. One more thing before we end out today. Look with me at Luke chapter 2 and verse 36. We're going to get into the praise of the prophetess, and we're just going to read through this very quickly. It says, And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84 years old. You guys see that? She never left the temple serving day and night with fastings and prayer. Now I want you guys to understand something. You're a Christian. Dear Christian, you think that your Christianity is wrapped up in functions and what you do and all kinds of religious ties. You got to understand something. Service to God is much more than that. As a matter of fact, you want to know what service looks like. Look at how this woman served God. 
She didn't necessarily have to go out and feed the poor or do this and do that. You know what her service looked like? You know what, what her service uh, was, was uh, called? It was called righteousness. It was a great display of a woman of the righteous remnant. Why? Because she never left the temple, serving day and night with fasting and prayer. There was a story that I heard that an old missionary, an old missionary could no longer go out to the mission field. His eyes were dimming. His voice was, he wasn't able to, to preach or minister the word of God any longer. Do you know how he served the Lord from that day forward until his death? Praying eight hours a day. Eight hours a day praying to the Lord he loved. So we see right here that this shows the extreme piety of this woman, this old woman in the temple. As a matter of fact, in verse two, uh, chapter, thir uh, chapter two, verse thirty-eight it says this: At the very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God, at that moment that after Simeon, Simeon did his uh, blessing of the child, right, and after uh, after he blessed the parents and then gave Mary that message, she walks up. She walks up. And at that very moment that she came up and she saw that, she gave thanks to God. Now, if the words had been recorded in this text, there would have been a fifth uh, praise song in the book of Luke. But it wasn't. And she continued to speak of him to all the people. This woman, as soon as she saw that, everybody who was in the temple, she went to and she proclaimed Christ. You guys see that? Anna was acquainted with a handful of people of God's remnant that still believed. Now, in conclusion, I just want to say this. I know it was a little bit of a long message, but in conclusion, I do want to say this. We must see, beloved, we must see this, beloved, as the message has been all along through this series. That Christmas is much more than how the world sees it. The world sees it as putting up lights. The world sees it as, as family get-togethers. The world sees it as, as a worldly celebration. And the world, you can honestly say, they, they should know better. They don't know better. They don't know better because all, all the evidence is there for them, but they don't know Christ. And so Christians should not celebrate Christmas in that manner. I'm not saying that you can't put up lights. I'm not saying that you can't have family get-togethers. But your celebration is much more than just that, right? Yes. Your celebration of Christ isn't just on one day. You're, the celebration of Christ for the Christian is what? Every day. The celebration of Christ is much more than lights and presents and family get-togethers. Why do I say that? Because if there was one thing that I wanted you guys to see in all these, these messages that we've done here, right? These songs, these ancient songs, these ancient uh, Christmas carols. One thing that these people worship and celebrated was the fulfillment of God's promise. You Christian, that's what you should be celebrating. Christmas is not a Christmas tree of presents. Christmas is the fulfillment of God's promise. God promised that he would send a deliverer, a savior to the world. And he did, Jesus Christ. And so for you, Christian, you who profess Christ, the world needs to see this type of celebration. We need to make known to the world the Christmas, that, that Christmas is a fulfillment of God's promises. That's what Christmas is. Teach your kids that. Teach your loved ones that. Because that's what Christmas is. It's the coming of Christ the Savior. Amen. Let's go ahead and bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the teaching that you've given us. We thank you, Father, that you've given us the opportunity to go through the ins and outs of the text, O oh Lord. But more importantly, Father, may we 
have seen the, the, the righteousness of worshipers, oh Lord, worshipers of old. They stand as examples to us, oh Lord, as Christians. Oh Lord, our lives should be much more than, than religious piety, oh Lord. Our lives, our love, should be a love, O oh Lord, that comes from the heart. Your word says, O oh Lord, that you are a God who sees not the outward appearance of man, but that you see the innermost being of a person. You know the innermost parts of a person. You know where our hearts are, O oh Lord. And I pray that this year, Father, as we come to a close this Christmas season, that you would convict our hearts if we're being loose in our love for you. May you be glorified, may you be magnified, O oh Lord. May you be exalted. All glory be to you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.